Okay, good morning. Let's get this started here. Um, appreciate you all being here. Thanks for coming. Um, this is uh, the first of a few talks on AI. Um, obviously, AI is a big topic here. And uh, so uh, we've got a session here this morning. There's also a session tomorrow. And Untether as well is a, is a company obviously involved in AI. They're actually gonna be next door while we're talking here, so it's not something you could do at the same time, so I'd encourage you, if you're interested in hearing what else they have to say, to, it's being recorded, and so to, to go back and look at the, uh, the recording afterwards, after we're done here. So uh, we've got four speakers for you here, uh, this morning. The first of them is from Brainchip, Anil Mankar. Uh, he has spent 30 years developing products in the semiconductor industry. At Western Digital, he developed PC CoreLogic chipsets, and then during his years at Connexent, in the, he was in the position of VP of Engineering, where he became the company's chief development officer, overseeing all other system, um, all other product developments for modems, set-top boxes, and other systems on chip products. He was the senior VP at VSI Engineering at MindSpeed Technologies responsible for wireless and VOIP infrastructure product development. And he's now here to talk to you on behalf of Brainship. Anil, if you please come up here and we'll get you started. Thanks. There we go. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction. We at Brainchip provide essential AI focus on the age AI devices. And today I'm going to talk about uh, how we deploy neuromorphic design principles for a system level performance, efficiency, configurability, and scalability for the age AI devices. So typically, uh, what you, when you want to provide age AI solution, it's important to really choose the right combination of architecture options and algorithms that you want to choose. As you heard from Linley in earlier talk, analog computation um, and uh, photonics and all of other exotic technologies are not yet ready for production. Also on algorithms, everything changes every day. So what you choose to implement in hardware and what kind of architecture choices you make are very important. We at uh, Brainchip chose low bit precision computation, at memory compute, and event based computation from an architecture perspective. And on the algorithm side, we chose both the CNN and SNN. We take the CNN and convert them into the spiking neural networks and run them on our hardware. Also, we chose to implement on chip few short learning. That allows us to train the native spiking neural network natively on chip, but it also allows us to do transfer learning of uh, CNNs more effectively on chip. So choosing those architecture options and algorithm option allows us to combine neomorphic design principle with the machine learning algorithms to be embedded into your AGI device efficiently. So what those choices allow us to do is to reduce the, and minimize the data movement that has to happen during inference, starting from the sensor where the data is created all the way to the SOC where the data is uh, inference. Also, it allows you to build a scalable device and a configurable device to meet the performance requirements for the AGI device and still maintain the efficiency of uh, AI inference. Also, when you really think about the age AI device, you have to maintain uh, the ease, ease uh, of deployment of the AI model that you already have. We support that with those architecture choices. Having uh, ported those devices to the defined architecture, we go further and optimize those machine learning algorithms on, on our hardware to they run more efficiently and take advantage of the neuromorphic design principle like uh, sparsity, scalability, and learning to make them more efficient. So basic 
technology foundation of the of the our IP depends on first thing is is fully digital design that allows us to be able to create chips that can be high volume production and ride on the process maturity and process technology that's already available for all the digital design. So you can go from we are process agnostic, you can go from 40 nanometer to 5 nanometer with a corresponding scale in performance and clock frequency. Also, reduce the size and the cost of the implementation. The second choice is actually running the standard CNN in hardware. Now, CNNs actually are very good for extracting features from data set, gives you better accuracy. Also, they are easy to deploy. We take those CNNs, convert them into SNN, and then run it on our hardware for inference. Of course, we do uh, native uh, SNN also on our hardware. The neuromorphic design principle is what makes it low power and low memory bandwidth. So by doing uh, at memory com event-based computation allows us to avoid unnecessarily multiplication by zero, both for weights and for activation. Also, each of the NPU having a local memory reduces the amount of memory that you have to move during inference. Because the hardware can be, uh, the network can be mapped to the hardware, now multiple layers uh, of net neural network, you can actually communicate uh, event-based communication between the layers, so you can do the uh, inference for the network without needing a CPU intervention. And to top, uh, top it off, we have on-chip learning that actually allows you uh, to uh, learn from incoming spikes for native SNN, where time-based time series data can learn directly. But also it allows you to take your CNN and do on-chip learning because now those CNNs have been converted to SNN. That actually gives you privacy because your data can stay on the device and also you can adapt the AI algorithm and application as, uh, as the environment there, uh, it, it operates changes, you can adapt it easily with on-chip learning. So those are the unique features that allow our, our IP to take uh, current S CNN, convert them to SNN, run also native SNN, and do solve today's problem and be ready for tomorrow. Little bit about the architecture. So if you can see on the right hand side, we have a neural processing unit that has its own memory, so it's at memory compute. Also, it can do uh, up to one, two, or four bit computation, both for activation and weights. So it's low, low memory footprint is required. Now, four of those NPUs are interconnect to each other at the first level of interconnect, and they make a node. And you can have multiple of those nodes connected by, by mesh that allows you to communicate between nodes. Now this IP is configurable. You can go from two nodes to 128 to 256 nodes. Uh, each of the node has their own address. And now the, uh, the self-configuring DMA actually can program those nodes. So given a neural network um, description, it can program itself. And also when the data is not spikes, it can take like uh, RGB frames or audio samples and convert spikes out of that and do all the computation in your morphic domain. The on-chip learning, each of the NPU has uh, a learning algorithm that allows you to really uh, make changes to the uh, on-device when the, when the training is required. Also, the configura configurability of the IP allows you to have a, a smaller let's say two node IP in a sensor and a slightly larger set of IP in a SOC. So you can actually also uh, reduce the data movement that is required during inference from a sensor. The sensor can do some level of neural network inference and send only the region of interest data to the SOC where the sensor region is happening. So what happens is because of the way the IP is designed, uh, you can actually uh, design your SOC for the scalability and configurability required for different market. Like in automotive, where performance and power is important, but may not be so much of learning. 
Similarly, on a home, uh, home uh, application, you might actually uh, need uh, learning and uh, uh, privacy, and latency may not be that important. And industrial IoT, again, the uh, performance and latency will be required. So you can adapt the same, similar, same node designs to a different market by choosing what you want to uh, deploy and what you want to, what is important to you in that market. We also allow in our IP two different modes. One is a low power mode, where uh, you actually take only the required NPUs and run the inference at a power and a performance you need. Or because all of these NPUs are running in parallel, each of them is independent, you can deploy more NPUs for each layer and uh, get a higher performance, corresponding higher power, so you can um, uh, implement uh, to add the needs of, of the age device change. Let's take an example. This is actually a mobile net v1.5 that has a number of layers that you see on the left. And this network can be fitted with a 32 NPs, which is eight nodes. You can see that each layer has enough compute elements and now you can run it either in a batch size of one. So you can see that as the frame moves across layers, it will uh, do the inference. Other layers where, which are not competing at that time, they are silent. So you get eight frames per second and 27 milliwatts. But you can actually send multiple frames to the hardware and be running, all the layers can be running in concurrently doing multiple frames. And now you get 32 frames per second at 67 milliwatts. The second way of doing that is you can actually go and apply, because you have a 20 node IP in our reference chip, you, even though it needed only eight nodes, you can deploy more compute elements per layer. And now you can get higher performance by using again a batch size of one. You will see that you get now 32, 20 frames per second at 118 milliwatts. Or you can go into pipeline mode again. That means uh, as frames coming in, you can let all the layers run concurrently and get a higher performance by uh, going to 110 frames per second and 650 milliwatts. So you can really go from 8 frames per second to 110 frames per second with corresponding increase from, this, uh, from the IP where it's implemented. All of this actually, second level of configurability and future proofing is also uh, allowed by doing a multi, what we call a multi-pass uh, multi processing. If you have a net neural network and depending on number of nodes that you have chosen to embed into your SOC, if the, if the network fits on the given amount, number of nodes, then you can of course allocate enough NPUs to all the layers and do it in one pass. In case uh, the network is bigger than the number of uh, nodes that are available, our runtime software will take that and implement the first five layers, let's say, and map it to the available hardware, save the intermediate results, and then take, take the next layers, reprogram them, reconfigure it, and do that in multi-pass. So you, as your network requirements change, you can do it on the same hardware that you chose to embed. All of that is available through a complete software tool suite that complements the standard, industry standard TensorFlow KOS. After you have taken your network and Im implemented uh, that in terms of chaos, now you can take it to a CNN to SNN tool that will convert it into a spiking neural network. You can do a quantization to four bits. Um, we have seen that four bits are good enough now. You can fine tune it, and then you save the network in a binary format for the runtime software to interpret it on the real hardware. Because it's compatible with industry standards tool, you can actually go further and use all the uh, techniques that are uh, available for, for, multi for uh, optimizing your networks like filter pruning or activity regularization. Through the activity regularization, you can increase the sparsity of the network that will result in lower power and smaller networks. We have actually taken those so, uh, as an example of mobile net v1. We actually optimize it for running it on our Akeda uh, hardware. We call it Akeda Net. So instead of a 4.2 million parameters for mobile net v1, the uh, optimized design 
reduces the parameters to 3.7 million. And now you can really um, also reduce its power because it's smaller size. And now you can actually take the activity regularization to increase paucity, and you can get a graph of we are saying is if a new paradigm shift is required, you cannot just take a smaller version of what you did in the cloud and hope it works because networks are expanding in their computation power requirements and of course the power. So that new paradigm shift is actually applying neuromorphic design principles to the AGI solution. What that does is actually brings, it fits the solution into the constraints that are available on the AGI device. Also, when you want to do a real life uh, uh, AI application where the data is temporal, standard CNNs lose the time element of the data. A lot of uh, native um, SNNs take advantage of uh, the time component of the data and a SNN will implement that. So it, the IP that we have come up with for embedding into the AI IoT device does both. It actually takes your CNN, takes into the neuromorphic world, and gets you the advantage of low power, low memory bandwidth, uh, and uh, efficiency. Also, it's ready for the future as new neuromorphic algorithms get developed. Uh, they run on the, our device, and they can be mapped to the uh, IP. We actually have a AKD 1000 reference chip. We have uh, PCI plug-in boards, and you can take any of those networks, both CNN and SNN, at our website. You can see the examples of running both CNN and SNN on our device and corresponding performance improvement that we have. We'll probably come back to the questions afterwards. Okay, I'll take questions now. I'll, I'll start with a couple of questions here just to seed things and then we'll turn over to you guys and see what, what kind of questions you have. One of the questions that I have just in general, you guys have been toiling away here on uh, neuromorphic for a while and there's all kinds of people in the market, um, but most people are not taking a, a neuromorphic approach. Why, haven't, why do you think most, more people haven't come in and tried to exploit neuromorphic characteristics in their accelerators? I think there are a few guys who are trying, but I think we have the most complete solution. Uh, of course, we have started quite early, and you can see that uh, some of the public announcements uh, that are deploying our neuromorphic IP solution. We chose neuromorphic because it reaches the bridges, the gap between today's solution and tomorrow's, and it does allow you to take sparsity and uh, get you low power and fit into the AI size. So I, we believe, um, we, we started the company with the belief that if you copy how brain works, it will lead us somewhere. I think we are having good solutions for lower end, always on devices, we get a very good solution. What are some of the challenges that you've run into? There's so many different kinds of architectures and things. And the way you guys approach things is fundamentally different. So what are some of the unique challenges that you guys have run into in uh, bringing, deploying your solution? Yeah, so we, uh, because if you really start telling people that we are neuromorphic, it's really a scary word because most of the algorithms are not available. And how do you convert? I mean, take a RGB data. 
how do you create spikes out of that? So we actually chose to really invest in a meta TF, so software tools was one of the biggest uh, challenges we had to do. So we could take a neural network and without making any changes to the standard and the data set, we actually went to the complete quantization and put the tools in place so that our customers don't have to worry that our solution is neuromorphic, but take the advantage of the neuromorphic solution. And we, we created all the software tools that convert them directly into SNN, including the data conversion from RGB frames to spikes. Of course, uh, we have actually other solution that uh, there are sensors coming in which uh, create spikes directly, like DVS camera sensor or tactile sensor. We have networks that are running. So we had to do a complete software hardware. We actually also went and implemented a chip so that you can actually test it out and see the performance uh, in a specific uh, technology, and you can scale from there. So we had to almost do a full ecosystem. We also have invested in our partners who actually take our solutions, reference chips, and convert their networks and see the advantage of, uh, uh, the, advantage of the solution. So it, it was, we, uh, what I would say is not only we designed the IP, but the reference chips, the board, the system software, runtime software, and actually converted some of the networks which are available on our model zoo uh, to see how they will perform on this hardware. And of course, because we chose neuromorphic, we could add on-chip learning. Without, uh, without that, uh, you cannot have on-chip learning. You mentioned the model zoo, and obviously there are a million different models out there. It almost seems like there are two categories. They're the models that people quote for performance, for benchmarking, things like that. You've got mobile net data up there. There's ResNet, you know, Lindley mentioned this morning, nobody actually runs ResNet. So they're sort of the ones we quote numbers from, and then there's the real world applications. I noticed that you developed your own model. You mentioned your Akita net. What motivated that? Because there's a million models, they change every day, and so you know, it seems like that's a lot of effort to do. Yeah, so let me tell, uh, be clear that we are not developing new models. We are taking the models that people would like to do classification or a keyword spotting, and we optimize it further to improve the sparsity and uh, because neuromorphic things take advantage of sparsity. So we retrain them using the regular techniques, and those are available as a reference model as to what can happen to the actual application. Right? So we have a few customers who have taken keyword spotting examples. They, they don't run the Google. I mean, of course, we have performance numbers for that, but they can go and develop their own extraction and things like that. And they're running on our hardware, and they have seen that by applying neuromorphic principles, they get a better performance and power rather than a standard DLA. So our model zoo is meant to be an example of what can happen. Now, we actually are uh, trying to uh, use some optimization techniques to make them more efficiently run our hardware and take advantage of sparsity and low, low memory bandwidth. But those are not meant to be a production level things. Those are good examples of what can happen. We work with our customers that take their models and their data sets, and then they'll, they use our tools to convert it themselves. They don't have to really expose their data sets and their networks uh, because it's just an acceleration of the function that we've chosen to accelerate in hardware. Okay, let's see. Do we have questions in the audience here? And uh, Jim's got the microphone back there. Please. Uh, yeah, we're not hearing that. Is my... Uh, okay, there we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I had a... Actually, three questions, but maybe I'll start with uh, one first. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you can pipeline all your uh, CNN computations uh, with, uh, you know, your architecture. Uh, typically, these uh, networks do contain uh, some activation functions as well, which uh, sometimes has to re revert to a different engine that uh, will do the nonlinear part of the activations. I didn't see that part in the presentation. I'm wondering how you handle that. OK, so I think uh, if you have a feed forward network that the output of one layer goes to the next layer, that is easy to pipeline. If you have a network that you want to get a CPU in, 
and do some computation, then you, you can save the results after a partial computation. Let the CPU come in and do something. Uh, now you can pipeline that, now it depends on how you use the application, but that becomes more complex. That means you might have to really take the first five layers, run 10 frames through that, save all the 10 results, let the CPU come in, combine some of them and give it back again into the neural network. But pipelining really works when the feed forward network is as simple as what people use. But if you have complex networks, uh, those functions are not supported, then you'll have to get, let the CPU come in and, and do that. And typically, then it'll be batch size of one. Got it. Thank you. Uh, one other question is, you have uh, limited the hardware to 4-bit and 2-bit, which is very nice for efficiency. I'm just wondering how that compares in terms of accuracy with 8-bit models that others run with normal uh, networks as well. Yeah, so we basically do only integer. Uh, our spikes are multi-valued, one, two, or four bit, and we did a lot of analysis uh, that you can try to match almost the eight bit uh, accuracy by doing quantization away training. You know you're going down to a four bit. This is, you can do that, there are techniques. But most of the network that we have seen, at, uh, you, you will lose a little bit of accuracy, but depends on your data set. Now take an example of mobile net v1. If you're doing 1,000 object classification, then the accuracy is 71%. But if you're doing 20 object classification, then the accuracy is pretty high. And again, it depends on your data set. Uh, once uh, we, we actually use the same mobile net one classification example. Now take your data set, do your transfer learning through our on-chip learning, and the accuracy we find is pretty high. So, even now, people are, there are enough papers published that 4-bit is good enough for accuracy. So it depends on, accuracy depends on your data set, your application. Taking the, doing the competition in your morphic domain doesn't do anything to the accuracy. Can, can you give a range if you were to compare the accuracy to eight? Yeah. eight what's the range? Yeah, so typically we have seen, well, you take a thousand object classification, instead of 71%, we lose about 0.5 to 1% of accuracy because we went to four bit. Very good, thank you. One final question is uh, uh, regarding your on device learning. Uh, how do you handle the back propagation aspect of it? No, so we don't really do back. Okay, so the back propagation is doing training. So you can, uh, you can use uh, your CNNs being trained with back propagation. And what we're doing is we're actually keeping all the features that you extracted in the first 30 layers of mobile net v1. And now you, uh, the last layer, which is, comes to the classification, we actually use on-chip learning there. So now what you're doing is, because the on-chip learning algorithm is saying spikes at the last layer, it's a different combination of the features that we use. So during that time, we are using uh, on-chip learning, which is what the brain does, uh, static time-independent plasticity. The brain doesn't use back propagation. Back, back propagation is only for statistical analysis of given data for CNN. Okay, do we have other questions? We're done? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Sharad Chol from uh, Expedera. He's the chief scientist and co-founder there and brings extensive experience in software hardware co-development to enable efficient AI processing. He's an expert in AI frameworks, power-aware neural network optimizations, DNNs, and programmable data flow architectures. Previously, he was an architect at Cisco, Memoir Systems, now part of Cisco, and Microsoft, and he holds a a BS from IIT Kampur. Right. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just let me know if I'm speaking too fast. Sometime I do that. So, uh, so today I would like to talk to you about uh, like a question that you might be challenged with or uh, you might 
be asking yourself if you want to develop an uh, AI SOC. And that question being, if you should build your own NPU from scratch, and obviously I would like to caution you against it, but uh, there are good reasons for it. So an NPU is uh, a neural processing unit. Uh, that's why we are in this talk. We all know what NPU is. But uh, basically why choosing a right NPU is critical is because uh, neural network inference requires billions of operations. And if you want to do this in real time, and that's probably the only reason you would like to build an NPU in an edge SOC uh, for real time inference, you need to process trillions of operations per second. And this has to be done while maintaining millions of weights as well as managing millions of activations. And so the choice of the NPU architecture would define what kind of thermal envelope your product will be in, what kind of bomb cost would be required in terms of bandwidth as well as like power management. And there are many considerations that we have to go through for defining an architecture and defining the workload that need to be used for that architecture. So before we go any further, uh, let me introduce Expedera. Uh, Expedera was founded in 2018 uh, with the sole purpose of uh, accelerating edge AI. Uh, we, uh, we specialize in uh, NPU IP for edge SOCs. Uh, we, we have like, global presence with three R&D centers. Um, we have numerous patents. And uh, since we came out of stealth last year, we have shipped more than 8 million consumer devices. And um, through last four years, we have learned quite a bit of things. Uh, we are already on our third generation of architecture. And uh, uh, in this talk, hopefully, I would be able to share some of these learnings with you. So when we first engage with our customers, uh, um, th there is a big evaluation process, obviously. They would like to see uh, benchmarks on different networks. Uh, typically, we get like tens to hundreds of networks to be evaluated on. Uh, they would like to see how easy it is to use our software stack. Um, but believe it or not, the biggest competition we face is not from the industry. It's actually the decision of make versus buy. And uh, uh, it's some, the, the reasons that we hear is like mentioned in the slides. And uh, some of these reasons might be rational. Some of these might not be that rational. But uh, ju just as an example, why not? Uh, it's, AI is still a cool thing to do. Why shouldn't I build one? Or I. I should be able to build a better or cheaper alternative than anyone in the industry. And uh, it's, it's a wishful thinking, but uh, uh, before we go down that road, what is important is to understand uh, different, different perspectives. Like uh, 